We're lucky that we've had some pretty incredible growth over the last five years. We double the company every year, maybe over the most recent four years. Uh, that's been our trajectory. And we never had enough people to do the work. And so we were stressed out. And when someone would leave, that was only seen as the negative. But but finally, we've been able to, to refine our hiring process and our success has gotten out. So we've been able to attract some some really talented people. And, and if there's someone who isn't aligned and would rather be just doing something else now, I think we've refined our philosophy there. That That's, that's a good thing. It's a, a success for them that they've been able to make pro progress and grow their career inside our, our four walls. And if the time is right for them to do something else, uh, we wish them well and hope, hope they get their dream job. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today, we're gonna look at your culture the people that really drive and allow you to scale your business the way you're scaling, well, it comes back to being intentional about culture. Our special guest today is the CEO and founder of Florence Healthcare. It's Ryan Jones. We unpack how he sees culture. We look at the place within the employee count uh, where they actually started to focus on culture, and it might be earlier than you expect, and it's right after product market fit. I'll let you find out the details inside here. Also, we look at, you know, very specifically, how does he empower people? How do you really uh, get people to connect to this? And why safety is such an important piece of culture. All of this unpacked in this conversation about being intentional about culture. My hope is you're the kind of leader that sees people as very important. And you know that they are the true asset of your company. And if you believe that and you want to learn from more that we're doing to create the kind of culture that really does attract talented people, allow you to perform your best and really excel and create a kind of company that people love to work at, then you want to make sure that you stay tuned in to not only the podcast, but you know, one of the things we do is we create um, space for founders like yourself that are listening in to understand what's missing inside their culture. What, what are the gaps? Uh, we call this the leadership readiness plan. And if you want to sign up for that, it's absolutely free. All you have to do is go to my website, genehammett.com and schedule your call, but you will find out what the leadership readiness plan is, and you will find out exactly if it's right for you. Now you do have to have a business that's over $2 million in revenue. You have to have people to be able to lead and you have to have um, the desire to change and evolve. So go to genehammett.com, schedule your call, and we will do the leadership readiness plan for you. It's absolutely free, and it will give you a real solid plan. I do that for you know so that to really connect with people and understand where they are. If you like the plan, you want to you know, execute on it yourself, go for it. If you want help with it, I'm here to help you. Um, if you don't like the plan, you haven't wasted anything. All that being said, just go to genehammett.com and schedule your call with me today. Now, here's the interview with Ryan. Ryan, how are you? I'm great. It's good to be with you, Gene. I'm excited to talk to you about culture and what makes Florence Healthcare work and grow. So why don't we start there? Tell us about the company. We're in a new category of software called clinical trial site enablement. Uh, man, that's a mouthful. But the, the bottom line is that the drug industry spends about $100 billion a year proving new drugs safe and effective. And that process is held together with people, paper, and airplanes, and it's really fragile and it takes far too long. And so we make software that connects the doctors that are handing out the experimental medication with the pharma companies that innovate it and make it. And we hope to get cures to market faster as a result. Well, Ryan, I'd like to ask a, one question about the industry before we dive into the culture side of our conversation. We've had some big changes through COVID over the last two or three years with different types of, of levels of service inside of healthcare. Where do you see this trending to over the next three years? Uh, it's actually in a crisis right now in, in terms of our corner of the industry. The FDA approves about 50 new drugs or devices a year. And those are the things that make all of our lives better from the COVID vaccine to, to new cancer therapies. Um, the cancer rate since 19, death rate since 1976 has fallen in half because of, of these sorts of innovations. So we need that innovation engine to keep going. Uh, but uh, on the heels of the pandemic, uh, the great resignation has been acutely focused on not only on healthcare, but on life science research in particular. So the, 
the nurses and the doctors that, that do clinical trials are a subset of the overall population of nurses and doctors. And it, as it turns out, they have resigned because in a lot of cases, they have a higher work, workload than, they, than the average uh, clinician. They've resigned at greater rates. So the people to do that work have uh, left the industry. And so now we're at a moment of crisis where the people that help the FDA prove new drugs safe and effective by, by running these clinical trials are now leaving the industry in greater and greater numbers than, than most jobs. And we're uh, starting to see the number of approved drugs slow down as a result. And that's bad for your family and mine. I, I want to kind of bridge the gap to this culture conversation, but you we're going to talk about your company, Florence Healthcare, mostly today. But in the industry, it sounds like they've got a, a crisis of culture inside the the work environment of this, the demands that are put on these clinicians and, and nurses and, and researchers. How would you describe what the real issue is? I think, unfortunately, these humans are fighting a culture, a battle, a crisis of culture on two fronts. One is it's tough to be a clinician in general, because not only do you have the stress of direct patient interaction and caring for humans that are sick, but generally hospital administrations are, are pretty bad, right? It's a pretty big bureaucracy, uh, tough to get things done, can be frustrating to work in that sort of environment. So that's the baseline. But then in most cases, those that care about research do that in addition to their core clinical work. So they have a clinical job maybe three or four days a week, and then they spend a day on top of that just um, in their whatever disease area they work in, whether it's cancer, or cardiology, or infectious disease, they'll do the work for the clinical drug trials in that extra day. And so that's a whole other layer of administrative work and, and challenge and another category of patients. And so you can see the frustration level of these humans grow as they're fighting bureaucracy and effort, not only in their day job, quote unquote, but also in this extra work that they do. And they, and they took on this extra work because they have a passion for helping people. And they hope to see that the degree to which they help people is amplified by doing research in addition to the core clinical stuff. So they feel like they're almost getting punished for uh, taking on that extra work. And, and I think, as you put it, Gene, that is a cultural problem. If they're working in an environment where, you know, going the extra mile to help humankind is, feels like a punishment. Only a, a revitalization of culture can can help with that. Well, let's transition into Florence Healthcare. Um, I'm going to take a leap because we're going to talk about your company culture philosophy. I bet you don't have a problem with people leaving too early and resigning before you're ready for them. Is that fair to say? <laughs> well, we've only become comfortable with that lately. We're lucky that we've had some pretty incredible growth over the last five years. We double the company every year maybe over the most recent four years, uh, that's been our trajectory. And we never had enough people to do the work. And so we were stressed out. And when someone would leave, that was only seen as the negative. But but finally, we've been able to, to refine our hiring process and our success has gotten out. So we've been able to attract some some really talented people. And, and if there's someone who isn't aligned and would rather be doing something else now, I think we've refined our philosophy there that that's, that's a good thing. It's a, a success for them that they've been able to make pro progress and grow their career inside our, our four walls. And if the time is right for them to do something else, uh, we wish them well and hope, hope they get their dream job. Perfect. When we think about culture, when you think about it and you were defining this, you're, you're over 250 employees, give or take right now. How early did you really start thinking about culture? Being intentional about culture has to uh, has to take place when you're not in the same room with people eight hours a day. And so I think we started thinking about it at the right time, but it's not me who gets the credit. It's our founding chief operating officer, Angela Nelms, who now is the CEO of a, of a fast growing biotech uh, device firm. She had the foresight to start being intentional about it when we weren't all in the same room together. And that's probably once you get to 10 or 12 people, you need to start being intentional. So for the first uh, two years of the business, we were smaller than that, just trying to find find product market fit. And if you sit across from someone every day, you you can you can manage culture just fine. And, and I'd say as we entered our third year, we started to have to be intentional about it. One of the first things we did is we used the uh, the philosophy of the book Radical Candor to spend a lot of time with our our team as people and get to know and show that we cared about them. 
so it could then be easier to be very direct with bad news. And that's that's the dance. It's how, how do you build trust with the person that you're working with as the team grows or the, all the humans that you're working with as the team grows? So that trust is strong enough so you don't have to feel like you sugar you sugarcoat things or dance around the issues that you actually need to work on because every business has problems that you need to be direct about. So I'd say probably in our third year, we got really intentional about it. And then after that, we started doing things like building intentional values and structuring how we do business in alignment with those values, how our processes lined up. Uh, and, and then and then start to build a whole set of processes to try and reinforce that. Now, Ryan's just talking about being direct with bad news. We we're talking about radical candor. You know, a lot of people struggle with this. I've talked to founders, talked to CEOs, experienced people, but even the, the, the mid-level people, the, even the people that are confident struggle with giving bad news and being talking directly with people. And we call these difficult conversations. Now, it really isn't a difficult conversation, but that's what everyone else refers to it. I think it's an opportunity conversation because no one wants to be delivering subpar work. No one wants to be out of alignment. And so you owe it to that person, you know, owe it to the team, and you owe it to the company, and you know it to all of the stakeholders to be able to give these difficult conversations, be direct with people, deliver the bad news, because that's the way we all grow. That's the way we get better. And we should create this as a normal thing, not something that we're whining about or, or picking at people, but we are doing it in service of them being better at what they do rising to that next level, growing, expanding, being able to see their blind spots. All these things in difficult conversations are necessary, but the cost of avoidance is huge. Too many people are avoiding these conversations and it is costing them on their bottom line. It is costing them in time. It is costing them in so many ways. Avoidance is hurting your business. Back to Ryan. I definitely want to talk about values with you, Ryan, but I don't want to leave this conversation of radical candor. It's, it's a very popular book. It was, you know, written by one of the people from Silicon Valley and, you know, some, it gets a little bit of a bad rap and, and it's, it's not the easiest book to read, um, hmm. but you found it, it works for you. What are the, the core principles inside that radical candor that you feel like has made you guys the, the culture that you are today? I, I think it, it is. And maybe it's too simplistic because it's only a starting point. It's not the fishing, finishing point. The starting point is how do you empower humans to feel that, that they are doing their best and that they are cared for so that you can do the, the unpleasant tasks that are associated with business a lot of the time, uh, breaking bad news, doing hard work that's thankless for an extended period with where the reward is deferred, meeting with customers that can be jerks sometimes. So it's that that two-part balance of empowering the human and creating safety, uh, showing and showing that you care for them. And then, and then that opens the door to take care of the unpleasant stuff that business has, has uh, endemic to it. And so we did that in a couple different ways. One is um, uh, empowerment. I've used that word a couple of times. So when someone joins our business, after 90 days, we ask them to get out their resume that they use to write uh, uh, to apply for that job and write a new section that's forward looking based on what they want to accomplish in the next two years working at Florence. And what that does is that gives them a roadmap for their career that they can bring to their managers so that when we set quarterly or annual goals, they're intentional about including the things that advance their career in that. So, so not only does it make them feel empowered, but actually empowers them because their ideas get in our corporate roadmap. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, safety. If you can't be your full self at work, you end up having sort of this overhead of bullshit where uh, you're, my, you're managing your identity or you're managing your goals, or you're managing your family life. Maybe you have a, you know, a child rearing scenario that's tough or you're going through a divorce or, or have other things to manage outside the four walls of the business. And we work really hard to make it clear that you can bring that baggage to work and be yourself at work and take time off if you need it and that you're a real person. So it's those two things, empowerment and, and, and being a safe place for you to be yourself, we think has cleared out a lot of the other BS that, that people generally have to try and, and stifle and freeze up those cycles that they would spend stifling it on actually doing work. So that's, that's how we've been trying to do it. I love that example you gave us of the 90-day exercise. I've never, never heard that. And that's one reason why I do this podcast is it gives me those little, you know, 
really specific examples of how people are aligning together. And this is a great example of empowering someone to write their own career path and, and really live into that while they're working with you. Um, fantastic example. You mentioned values, Ryan. I, I really have um, heard so many times about companies that are growing fast, just like you guys are doubling every year, that they put a lot of emphasis on values. And I think a lot of companies that are growing slower, they might have them, but they don't mm -hmm. truly live the values. Would you say that you guys really live the values? If so, how? So there's, uh, for, for what I've figured out as a leader, we have about 250 people uh, that work at Florence now. And the hardest leadership moment was probably when we were around 100, because that's a scale where you just can't spend time with everyone anymore. And the, the, the secret that, that, I, that a mentor taught me about managing well back when I worked for Microsoft was all about cadences. People are creatures of habit. And so if you create events or moments that are expected in a schedule, whether it's daily, monthly, or annually, um, that allows you to reinforce things and values are something you want to reinforce. So annually, we revise our values using the whole company and an exercise where we break the whole company into groups and they work on a couple different areas of our values to make sure they're still aligned with how we actually are so that we don't have values that are full of hot air. They're actually congruent with, with how people behave in the business. And then that's one cadence that we have. And then the second cadence is in our monthly all hands, we actually structure that all hands by our values. So we talk about issues that align to our four values. And our four values are um, experimentation is our superpower, shipping is the game, um, integrity is non-negotiable, and being good humans is the point. Uh, and so we create this cadence around those four values so that not only are they top of mind, but we actually talk about the problems that we're working on through the lens of those four values and that, that, uh, that reinforce or weaves them into how we run the business on, a, on at least a monthly basis. Now, Ryan was just talking about the cadence of communication. Here's the thing I know, working with a lot of companies that have you know 10 or 20 employees and then and they have 50 and then they have 100 and then they have 200 or 250, at every level, there's communication breakdowns and you have to find the new rhythms and cadences of these communication. What used to work may not work anymore. What used to be four people sitting around a lunch table being able to discuss what's going on was very efficient. But as you get to be 20 people, that's harder. So you've got to look at how communication is being challenged as you grow and how do we improve on that? And don't be afraid to let go of what we used to do to really embrace who you are today and who you're becoming. The cadence of communication is a really important part of being intentional about your culture. Back to Ryan. The cadence is perfect to talk about it. I'm, I'm, you gave us this a great example of that, you know, using the resume to empower people. What would we see inside the rhythms of your company that we could learn from? I, it's one of the things we're trying to get right. And I don't think we quite have it all right, but I'm happy, happy to share where we're getting, getting it wrong too. You know, one example is when we were smaller, we did a daily standup. And this was a, you know, as you've encountered lots Gene is like a pretty typical modern software business scrum methodology thing, where in order to, to break down communication silos, everyone's, you know, once a day at 10 a.m., we get up and do a 20-minute meeting company-wide where each department or each human could describe what they were working on. And so we started, everyone reported in the stand-up when we were up to like 20 people. And then we did department updates from when we were like 20 to... Uh, actually, until very recently, every uh, every day, and then that just became too ungainly. And then we reduced it to once a week. And then we changed what the definition of a department was: a fewer departments. And now we're going to replace that with biweekly department updates. So a tough thing to cadences are hard because not only do they have to be accommodated by people's calendars, but they also have to be accommodated by what you're trying to communicate during them or, or get, decide and get done during them. That's one, one example of something that worked really well when we were like below 50 people, but we're now trying to get right now that the company's gotten bigger. Other cadences we, we've developed is a, a, a monthly all hands where we are very transparent about how the business is doing so that people can understand how to steer their job to what we're trying to accomplish together. And we do these things called flocks, which we've invented on a quarterly or semi-annual basis now that we're, we work in a hybrid way. And so it's tougher to get humans together in the same room. 
and we were really intentional cadences to try and create that both on a department level every quarter, but uh, semi-annually for the whole company. So, so we haven't gotten it all is, right yet, but we're getting there. Is the flocks uh, in person? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we fly the whole company in uh, twice a year together. Uh, and it's tough to squeeze us all in the office, but we manage. You do that in Atlanta or do you go do that offsite? We do it in it. We do it in Atlanta. And then our, our second largest office is actually in Belgrade, Serbia. So we do, uh, we do that there as well. Fantastic. Ryan, we've been talking about culture and really being intentional about that. Um, do you feel like we've left anything out that you want to make sure you bring to light? Uh, no, I, I think I would reinforce the thing that's worked for us is creating a, a culture of empowerment. We talked a little bit about that at the top of the podcast, but also experimentation. We, we say during orientation, and, it, and we work real hard to make it the truth that no one gets fired for making a mistake. Mistakes are good. Mistakes mean that you're shipping something early enough where there's a little risk of it falling down, and that means you're going fast enough. Uh, so the freedom to experiment and make mistakes and, and, uh, and empowerment is what we try and do here at Florence. Ryan, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing what it looks like inside of a fast growth company this is exactly the reason why we do these interviews. So I appreciate your wisdom. Congrats on the success of your practice, Gene. It was great to be with you. A great interview here. I love talking to founders about what's going on inside their businesses, really diving into specifics. That 90-day resume exercise is something I'm going to borrow and share with my clients. Uh, I've done hundreds and hundreds of these things, and I'm always looking for these unique nuggets of how do we actually do the things that we need to do, change behaviors. That example of empowering others by letting them define their career path, how they want to grow, how they want to be involved is fantastic. And so my hope is that you're writing these things down, continuous to come back to evolve. Now, if you want the shortcut and you believe that you, we could help you and your team perform at a higher level, just go to genehammond.com and schedule a call today. It'd be great to get to know you and what's going on. When you think about leadership and you think about growth, think about growth think tank. As always, the courage. We'll see you next time.